Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast as we continue on here with some 2024 NBA draft conversations. And here I want to break it down into, again, a little bit of a generic activity here, but winners and losers of the 2024 NBA draft. And I'm going to try and maybe stick away a little bit from traditional you know, teams as a winner or a loser the number one winner I have is Victor Wembenyama, who the number one storyline that I was looking forward to in this draft is what are the Spurs going to do to build around Wemby? And there was a very clear need to have enhanced guard play after a little bit of a mess in San Antonio last year. And they start out by getting Stefan Castle, who is somebody it is a little bit unclear whether or not he is going to be an actual traditional point guard for them, but has the potential to, and immediately is going to complement Wemby in terms of the defense, where we saw the horrendous numbers for the Spurs defense when Wembenyama was off the court, and that he was kind of just carrying a very lackluster group on his shoulders, and now he has Stefan Castle to sort of lock down the perimeter a little bit more for him, and it's a team effort. It's not like you can just put two players on a defense and automatically they are going to, you know, the whole team is going to get better, but I think it's a great start Again, defensively, plus the upside of what Castle could be on offense, but they also add to that as well with their other second-round picks that I think also complement Wembenyama pretty well in uh, adding Harrison Ingram with the late pick and then adding the point guard from Spain as well, Nunez, to be able to just provide a little bit of extra spacing for Nunez, a little bit more ball handling, some increased point guard play. We'll see how they choose to divvy up the point guard minutes. But again, just having people on the roster that can make the basic passes and plays that Wembenyama needs because he was kind of doing a lot of it by himself last year. So I definitely wanted to you know, see them go with a guard. And when they initially passed on Tyler Kolek in the second round, they were picking 35. And I was a little disappointed that they didn't get Kolek. Kolek is somebody that, at least personally me, who watches college basketball a lot, that I, you know, am more familiar with him and that I thought he would have been, I think he's maybe one of, if not the best pure passer in the NBA alone, but for them to still be able to go out and get Nunez, who, again, you know, from Spain, I don't necessarily have quite in-depth of a knowledge of what he can bring, but he is well regarded as an excellent playmaker and... Again, just having any sort of additional guard help is going to be beneficial for Wembenyama. My next winner, I have Danny Ainge. Talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, the fact that Ainge has been in a position as a GM for a number of years since he was with the Celtics, that he just wants to make the right move no matter what that is excluding the idea of what is the state of the current team just in a vacuum is this the right move for us right now and it seemed like that's kind of the way that he went about in this year's draft again going for all of the high pedigree high school recruits that have you know I would say he's still on the younger side now Filipowski he was a sophomore this past year so he has a little bit more experience of course and Um, But he was the seventh overall recruit in 2022. You add two top seven guys in Cody Williams and Isaiah Collier in the first round as well. I have sort of no complaints for Danny Ainge here. Now, again, there are still a lot of things to come here for the Jazz. Danny wants to basically win every single transaction that he makes. And there's going to be a big decision to come in terms of what to do with Laurie Markkinen, who 
I would imagine is going to be sought after this summer in terms of a player that could very much be available and I think has a real winning impact on a number of teams. And that's just something I would keep an eye out for. It will be interesting to see sort of, because I don't know, if off the top of my head, ranking who is the better player of Laurie Markkinen and Mikhail Bridges, I think it's really close. Now, are the Jazz going to be able to get four, five first round draft picks out of that? I would have to assume probably not. So maybe Ainge is going to look at that, assess what he believes the val- the current market value is and sit on it. But we will see how he chooses to go about this as a whole. Um, I consider the Trailblazers winners out of this, considering the fact that they got, you know, a very solid player in Donovan Klingon who... I just believe is going to have an NBA career. Now, is he ever going to be an all-star? I would probably lean no, but I feel like he can be what DeAndre Ayton is and maybe even a little bit better. And Ayton was once regarded as one of the most promising up-and-coming players when he was with the Suns in those first couple years that they started competing and call it, I don't know, 19, 20, 21. There was gradual improvement. And I think one of the big things that sort of tore him down was the fact that the idea of his work ethic and him being locked in wasn't necessarily there. I think there's a different story with Klingon where... I do believe that he is somebody you can sort of have be a main cog in your overall foundation of the intensity you work out with and such. And, you know, has some championship experience, played under Dan Hurley. So, you know, he knows what it takes to win, at least on the collegiate level. Now, obviously, far different story when you get to the NBA. But at the same time, I think that he's going to be somebody that, Trailblazers fans can feel good about. Again, they are going to need to figure out that big man rotation and probably move somebody out of Aiton and uh, moving on from Aiton, Robert Williams, or who knows, maybe they pull off a crazy trade with Klingon. I kind of doubt it. But, you know, they so they make that pick in bringing in Klingon. They also get Denny Avdia, who I, I've been talking about it for the past couple days I feel like that's a very promising piece to have still at just 23 years old, despite the fact that he's been in the league for what, four years now that he is finally showing some consistency on the offensive side of the ball. He's never been a selfish basketball player. I really do think that he can, um, you know, contribute to winning in terms of moving the ball around. And again, 50, 37% shooting splits on 15 points per game last year. That is really impressive for him from where we were at coming into the NBA. He's a fine playmaker, and he's a really good defender. So that's an option. If they were to look to potentially trade Jeremy Grant, I could see Avdia very easily. And maybe even if Grant's still there, having Avdia in the starting lineup, maybe going a little bit lengthier. But I really did like that addition for the Trailblazers, so I wanted to give them credit for pulling off that deal. And... Moving on from Malcolm Malcolm Brogdon, who was just crowding the locker room in the guard space when he was with Portland. So that was an easy decision. And what, you're giving up the 14th overall pick in this draft? I think that's nothing. And I would much rather have Denny Avdia than whatever options were available to them at 14th. But I do have a couple losers here. The Milwaukee Bucks, just considering the fact that I can't get over the way they chose to go about this unless they think that A.J. Johnson and Tyler Smith are both going to be able to have this trade value because they're these young developmental pieces that maybe they make another deal, you know, cheap contracts to throw in a deal. There have been Brooke Lopez rumors, um, pretty much, pretty much main Brook Lopez rumors. There's been maybe a little bit of noise about could Chris Middleton go. I would assume probably not, especially after the flashes that he showed in the playoffs series against the Indiana Pacers last year. But I just did not like the way that they chose to go about this of taking two players that Tyler Smith probably has a better chance of contributing 
first couple years, but Doc Rivers doesn't like playing young players. We saw that last year with Andre Jackson, and you're going to sort of double down on these inexperienced types. Doc Rivers, I'm curious what his you know, role was in this decision-making because it's so uncharacteristic of what he's done in the past, and I don't believe it makes them any more competitive this upcoming season where it feels like Maybe the window is a little bit shorter than we had initially thought. Who knows? Um, definitely a bunch of different ways that you can sort of... A, de- a couple ways you can look at this deal and choose to judge it. But final loser of this is the NBA. They The year-to-year draft production is just such a mess. They need to find a way to be able to... Actually, I don't know if it's even, you know, the fact of just putting a cap on you can't trade for players once they're selected, at least on draft night. I don't know. I know that sounds stupid off the top of my head, but the way that we have all of these players going to put on hats of other teams that we already know they're not playing for and that you sort of have to do this extra level of digging because if you just look at the overall draft board, you're going to have all of these different players, especially when you get to the second round where basically every pick was traded and Malika Andrews, it it sounded like she was scrambling for her life to some degree. She knows it's ridiculous. Adam Silver, when he was announcing the trades in the first round when he was up at the podium, he was laughing to himself, giving these shrugs like... Yeah, we know that this is wrong, but this is the way that we do things. So we're going to announce that, you know, Rob Dillingham is no longer a spur. Seven picks after he's been moved and we already knew he was on the Timberwolves. All of it's just so ridiculous. But, you know, that's just me as a viewer wanting a better experience. I think that it probably mirrors the way that a lot of people feel. I don't know what the fix is, but they have to find a way to do something better. And also the fact that there is very little analysis, it feels like, in terms of how they actually fit into, you know, the the roster and what that looks like. It doesn't feel like there's all that much analysis there. Again, maybe that's something that I personally am on my own island with, but I just feel like the NFL draft does such a better job. And if the NBA is going to lean into this two night event of the draft, then I probably up the production there and make it something that people are actually interested in because it was a little bit of a disaster, but let me know your winners and losers for the draft. We're going to be taking one final break here. And when we come back on the other side, we are going to dive into just the transactions that have taken place over the past 48 hours of so or so some of them maybe flying a little bit under the radar with all the madness that has been going on. So stick with us and we will be right back after this quick break. <laughs> 